As I mentioned, uh, again, I'm Dr. Williams, and I'm in the Division of Orthopedic Surgery here at Coordinated Health. Let's talk about arthritis a little bit. Um, arthritis technically, if, if we're trying to be exactly correct, is inflammation of a joint. Usually arthritis results in accelerated uh, wear and tear of that joint. There are many causes of arthritis. It can be the result of an injury earlier in life. Uh, it can be the result of activity. Uh, for instance, if you had a job where you stood on your feet for 40 or 50 years on concrete, um, it can be the result of something you're born with, not that you're born with arthritis, but you're born with deformity of a joint which later on goes on to develop arthritis. Um, that big word, autoimmune, that's uh, a way of saying either psoriatic arthritis, which you've seen Phil Mickelson advertise on TV, or rheumatoid arthritis. And infection at an earlier time can cause the joint to decay and become arthritic. The most common kind of arthritis is called osteoarthritis, and it's a degenerative or wear and tear arthritis. Here's some x-rays of a hip. Now, the x-ray on the right is a normal uh, or relatively normal hip. You see you've got a nice um, dark area here. That's the joint space. Actually, this patient is starting to get a little arthritis. You can see a little bit of whiteness here and a little spurring. But then that goes on to our uh, picture here. You can see you've lost that nice round dark space and, and the white area has become more pronounced. That's wear and tear arthritis of the hip. If we look at the knee, this is a nice x-ray of a normal knee. Nice smooth surfaces, nice big wide open space. And obviously you can see here the wide open space is no longer there and that nice smooth surface, well that's not so smooth anymore. Osteoarthritis and osteoporosis are not the same thing. I have many patients get that confused and they ask me, well, I have osteoporosis, does that mean I have osteoarthritis? They're really not even related at all, except they're both found in what I'm going to call the more mature individual, translate older, and both words begin with the word osteo, which is a Greek word that means bone. Okay, so they both involve the bone, but other than that, they're not at all related. So we're going to talk about osteoarthritis tonight. What, how much of a problem is arthritis? Well, 46 million Americans suffer from arthritis. That results in 44 million doctor visits a year and in about 1 million hospital admissions per year. So it's not a small, we're not talking about a, yeah, it's not a big deal. We're talking about a big problem. Arthritis has a low mortality rate, which means it's probably not going to kill you, but it has a high morbidity. Morbidity is a quality of life thing, meaning you have pain, you don't want to do things, you can't walk, you can't go up and down stairs. That's morbidity. So I guess it doesn't kill you, but it sometimes makes you kind of wish it would. What are the symptoms of arthritis? Well, if we remember the movie The Wizard of Oz and The Tin Man, he was stiff, he had pain, and again, the, the symptoms are pain, worse with weight bearing, meaning worse with walking, putting weight, getting up and down out of a chair, arising from a seated position. Many patients with arthritis can have pain at night, 
Why do you have pain at night? I tell patients it's because during the daytime, your brain's concentrating on all the stuff you have to do during the day, whereas at nighttime, it doesn't have anything to do except let you fall asleep. And now all these things start, you know, ah, this hurts, that hurts. We can get swelling with arthritis. Now, if you have arthritis of the hip, you're probably not going to see swelling. But if you have arthritis of the knee, you probably will see swelling. Stiffness, that feeling of, okay, it's morning and now I got to get out of bed. Well, let's move the, okay, that moves okay. All right, oh, this one not quite so good. That stiffness. Grinding in the joint, the joint actually can make noise, which sometimes sounds like somebody stepping on crackers or, or marbles in the joint. Medically, we call that crepitation, but that's, it's grinding of the joint. Who is the typical patient with arthritis? The typical patient with arthritis, particularly the wear and tear arthritis, is an older patient. We're all there, unfortunately. A female patient, why a female patient? Because the women outlive the men. There's more women around who are in their 80s than there are men. And unfortunately for all of us, usually the patient with arthritis is at least somewhat overweight. And that's both for the men and the women. So we can't, I can't point the finger at any of you folks, that's for sure. Um, so here you see you have a picture of a man. Um, you can't see if he's overweight or not, but he's obviously older and he's using a walker, which probably makes you think he's got some pain in his, in his legs. What are the multiple treatments for arthritis? We can do activity modification, and I'm gonna go through each one of these in detail. Act activity modification, weight loss, physical therapy, bracing, pain medication, which I'm gonna call non-anti-inflammatory medication. Then there's the anti-inflammatory medication, which we call non-steroidal because it doesn't have cortisone in it. Steroid injections, a big, another type of injection, big long word, visco supplementation, and then sometimes surgery. But notice, where is surgery in this list? It's all the way at the bottom after you've tried many of the other things, hopefully. Let's talk about activity modification. What do we mean? Well, you take it easy a little bit. You take, you, maybe you don't use the stairs quite so much. You pace yourself. My dad is 89 years old, and before he got sold his house a couple years ago, he would say, gee, you know, I used to be able to trim the hedges and do X, Y, and Z and do it all in one day, and now I have to break it up and take two days or three days. That's pacing yourself. Exercise. There's weight-bearing exercise, things like walking, and non-weight-bearing exercise, more things like lifting weights or swimming. One can use an assistive device. That can range anywhere from a cane to crutches to a walker. Most of my older patients don't use crutches very well. So by the time we get into that age group, usually it's either a cane or a walker. When you use the cane, you have to use it on the opposite side. So please do not imitate Dr. House because he had a bad, whichever leg it was, and he used the cane on the same side. And I once had about a 15 minute discussion with a patient about why that was wrong. And she still didn't believe me because Dr. House used it on that side. And I guess he's smart. Weight loss. Okay. We can all do it. Let me tell you. However, every pound gained or lost is a gain or loss of four pounds of force on the knee or hip. I had a patient came in one time I was getting ready to do bilateral knees on him, and he said, Doc, he said, I'm going to go get my gastric bypass first. I said, great, good idea. So he got his gastric bypass. He came back to me six months later. He looked terrible, but he had lost like 150 pounds. And he said, Doc, my knees don't hurt anymore. I said, okay, well, then you don't need your knees replaced. I mean, his x-rays look terrible, but he doesn't, he doesn't have pain because he, he basically took 600, 600 pounds of force off his knees by losing the 150 pounds. Unfortunately, it's kind of hard to lose weight because you can't really, if your knees or your hips hurt, you can't exercise to lose the weight. However, this caveat here, consuming food with either Diet Coke or Pepsi, 
or in some cases light beer, negates any calories associated with that food. So you can have a big plate of pasta, have a little Diet Coke and there's no calories. Please do not believe that one. Physical therapy, how does physical therapy help? Um, physical therapy, the therapist can teach you how to use that cane that we've really been wanting to use, use to use properly. There's exercises which can help strengthen the muscles that go around the joint to help the joint run more efficiently. The physical therapist can help you evaluate what maybe you're already on an exercise program and the therapist can kind of say, look, this is good exercise, this is not good exercise. Therapists can use modalities like heat or ice to help make the joint feel better. And a good therapist is very motivational, okay? Sort of like this fellow down here. We hope that he is not your physical therapist. Bracing. Um, you can't really brace the hip, but you can brace the knee. And bracing can range anywhere from an ACE wrap, which is just a little support and a little warmth for the knee, up to a neoprene sleeve, which is a little more support and, and a little easier to put on. Then sometimes we use a knee sleeve with hinges because the hinges help support the knee a little bit. And then if we're really going to brace, there's something called an unloader brace, which helps to transfer the weight to other parts of the leg. The only problem with the unloader brace is it's, it's very large, it's very cumbersome to put on, and um, it, they don't always fit the best. So we spend a lot of money on the brace and then the patient, you know, after a couple of weeks says, ah, forget it doc, not going to use it. Now let's talk about medication. Um, we're going to talk first of all about what I would call non-anti-inflammatory medicine. This is just medicine for pain. The most common is Tylenol or acetaminophen. Um, extra strength Tylenol is the 500 milligrams. You can do two of those up to three times a day. Tylenol arthritis is simply an extended release where you take two pills and supposedly it lasts all day. It doesn't always work that way. Unfortunately, it seems like the makers of Tylenol, a lot of the drug stores and the pharmacies and the food stores, they're not getting the branded Tylenol. They get the store brand, which is really just as good. There are other types of medications we call topicals, which is something applied to the skin. A, a common example is Bengay. And how does Bengay work? Bengay makes the knee, or whatever you rub it on, feel warmer, and it sort of confuses the pain fibers. And so sometimes Bengay helps. The only problem is Bengay smells. There's another pain medicine called tramadol, which is by prescription only. Um, it's a non-narcotic pain medicine, works pretty well. The only caution is in older patients, sometimes they get a little confused. Then in some cases we move on to the narcotics. Hydrocodone, the brand name is Vicodin. Oxycodone, the brand name is Percocet. Um, try to use that very sparingly because they are addictive. There are long-acting narcotics. Duragesic is a patch. Oxycontin is a pill. Um, Oxycontin sort of got a bad rap because the drug dealers like it. Um, but you know, in small doses and used regularly in, in patients who sort of have chronic pain, it, it works. Then there's also nutritional supplements. The most common one is glucosamine and chondroitin. A common brand name is osteobiflex. I tell my patients, if you're going to use this stuff, go to the drugstore, find the osteobiflex. Right next to it is the generic. Buy the generic. Um, the, uh, the glucosamine and chondroitin seems to help about half the people who take it. There are no side effects. Uh, you have to take it at least a month to see if it's going to help, but definitely worth a try. Now the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication, abbreviated NSAID, the over-the-counter versions are Advil, Aleve, and Motrin IB. Um, they're, they're decent medicines. Um, I don't really care for the ads for Aleve, but I tell patients, the stuff works. <clears throat> the prescription versions of these are Motrin, Naperson, Mobic is kind of nice because it's a once-a-day medicine, Voltaren, Celebrex, 
Relifin, Depro, Clinaril, and Lodine. These are all older ones that are now available as a generic. Um, Celebrex is the only, it, Celebrex and Voltaren are the only ones only available as a, as a um, non-generic or branded product. Celebrex is kind of nice because it, it has less of stomach upset. Then there's some topical anti-inflammatories that work very nice, particularly in joints like for the knee and for other joints, not so much the hip. Um, these are called Voltaren Gel, Pensed, and a Flector Patch. The most commonly used one is Voltaren Gel. Now, side effects of the non-steroidals. I, I always have to laugh at the Celebrex commercial because they spend 15 seconds telling you why to use it. And then they spend 45 seconds telling you of all the awful things that are going to happen to you if you use it. Um, the, the, the more serious side effects are gastrointestinal, like bleeding ulcer, um, heart, you know, heart attack, uh, stroke, liver and kidney damage. Now, the chances of those things happening are about one in 100,000. If you drive a car in the Lehigh Valley, your chances of being killed in a car accident every year are one in 20,000. So you're out there on the road with all the rest of us dinglings who talk on our cell phones, put makeup on, at least the ladies do, um, read their magazine, uh, eat, drink, you know, play the radio, and yet we all drive our car. I mean, nobody walked here tonight, right? So I say to patients, look, if the medicine is helping you, take the medicine. Um, the the non-steroidal, the NSAIDs can interact with other medications. So if you're on Warfarin or Plavix, you probably should not be using oral non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines. You can use the topicals though because you don't really absorb that much. Um, aspirin, if you're on a baby aspirin, baby aspirin doesn't count, you can use the NSAIDs. If you're on full dose aspirin, you kind of have to talk to your doctor about that one. The topical ones tend to have fewer, fewer side effects and I tell patients when I give them a prescription for Voltaren gel, when you read the side effect labels, Remember, you're not going to eat this stuff. You're going to rub it on. So you're not going to get all these crazy things. And, and, you know, of course, we get this big list of all the side effects. Why do we do that? Well, it's this group right here, okay? And uh, here's a quote from, say, from Shakespeare with which I kind of agree, at least on some days, depending on what's going on. Okay, so let's say you've tried medications, didn't work. What's our next step? Usually it's a cortisone injection. And honestly, these are not nearly as bad as some patients, you know, oh, my friend had one and, you know, it was terrible. We use a small needle, we freeze the skin. Um, I, I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years and I probably inject five or 10 knees a day and, and a couple of shoulders a day. And, and it's just, we know what we're doing. We hope so anyway. The steroid injection helps about 65 to 75 percent of the time. The improvement might be temporary, but temporary can be anything from a few days to years. I, I've had patients come in and say, yeah, you know, I got a cortisone shot 10 years ago and my knee just started hurting last month. Okay, so, so you got a pretty good result from that steroid injection. The question of repeat injections. Um, there is no hard and fast rule that you can only get three injections or you can only get one injection a year. Talk to your doctor. What I say to patients is, look, define what repeat stands for. If, if you come in once a month to get a cortisone injection, that's not a good thing. If you come in twice a year, not a big deal. Why do we not like to do the repeat injections? Because frequently repeated injections can actually damage the joint. So again, I don't want you to come in once a month and say, hey, Doc Williams, you know, my knee was doing good for three weeks. Let's, let me have another cortisone shot. I'm going to say, look, let's back up and see what else we need to do. What kind of side effects from cortisone injections? About 10% of patients actually have a little more pain that night. I tell them, put ice on it. Um, in folks who are darker complected, you can actually get some, some little white spots. We call that atrophy of the pigment from from the cortisone. Uh, systemic in, um, side effects, if you're diabetic, I tell my patients your blood sugar is going to go up for three or four days. If you don't absolutely need to, don't just don't test your sugar for those couple days because you're just going to get upset 
and I promise you your blood sugar is going to go back down again. Now, let's talk about the other kind of injection, which the, the big medical name is viscosupplementation. Um, why do I have a picture of a chicken? Because the, the medication is, most of it's made from rooster comb. Um, I tell patients it's the one that didn't make it to Kentucky Fried. And they process that material, and it's, it's sort of like a gel, and it's, it cushions and lubricates the inside of the joint. Unfortunately, it's only approved by the FDA for the knee. I have actually done it in the shoulder, but we have to sort of get free samples from the drug company and, and I have to explain to the patient, look, it's really not approved for this joint, but sometimes it helps. There are about six different brands, Synvisc, Suparts, Hyalgin, Orthovisc, and Euflexa. Um, they all work about the same. Um, each, each company will tell you why their product is better than the next one. It's sort of like the presidential debates, flip a coin. Um, the only difference is that Euflexa is not a poultry-based product. It's actually bioengineered from bacteria. It works, and, and I sort of save that one for folks who come in and you know they're allergic to feathers or chicken or whatever. It's a series of between one and five injections, depending on which brand. It helps 65 to 70 percent of the time. Remember what I said about the, the cortisone injections? Kind of about the same. It can be redone in six months. If a patient comes in, they get good results for at least six months, and then they say, Doc, I was doing good, now my knee's hurting again, I'll say, fine, we'll, we'll do the injections again. And, and patients can get six to 12 months of relief, um, and, and you can repeat the injections for eternity. There's no, there's no increased side effect by, by um, repeating the series, if it helps. Side effects. Uh, the, the only side effect, again, think about 10% of the people, the knee is going to be sore that night. Um, sometimes the knee gets so sore that we think, gee, do they have an infection in there? It, that soreness usually passes, um, and that's really it for the side effects. It doesn't interact with other medications or anything, so the, the stuff is pretty safe. Okay, so let's talk about surgery for arthritis. There's different kinds of surgery. There's arthroscopic surgery. There's what we call open surgery, which means you make a big incision um, where maybe you didn't replace the knee or hip. And then there's joint replacement. Let's talk about arthroscopic surgery. It's most commonly done for knee arthritis, although they're starting to do it a little bit for hip arthritis as well. It's usually done to, in the knee, you've got a structure called the meniscus, which is a little shock absorber, which wears out. And usually what we do is go in and take out the, point, the worn out part of the, of the uh, meniscus. We can sometimes smooth down what we, the arthritic surface, which kind of looks rough. And uh, think of in a cave, you know, the stalactites or mites, I can never remember which, hanging down. We can sort of go in and smooth those off. The nice thing about arthroscopic surgery is that it's outpatient surgery. So you come in, you have it done, you go home. The bad thing is, is that you only get a good result about 60% of the time in somebody that's got arthritis. So I, I, it's not something that I commonly recommend because I like things that work better than 60% of the time. Here's a, um, here's a picture of a relatively normal knee, nice smooth surface here. That's the, that's the end of the femur bone. Here's the top of the shin bone. And then here, this wispy thing here is that thing we call the meniscus. And as you can see, there's a little bit of a difference here. This is what arthritis looks like. It's, it's no longer a nice, smooth surface. It's rough. It's nasty. It looks like a pothole out here on 512. Now, what about open surgery for the knee, but not a replacement? If you look at this person here, you can see that this leg sort of comes down and goes out. That's, that's a relatively normal position, but this leg kind of goes the reverse. It goes out and then in. And so this part of the joint is very arthritic. It's, it's you know, think of um, your shocks are worn on the one side of the car. Um, it's usually, the non-replacement open surgery is usually done for the knee. What we do is called an osteotomy. So we actually go in and cut the bone and kind of 
bring it out this way. We usually do that in younger active patients who are too young and too active to have a knee replacement. It's about 70 to 80 percent effective. We, we don't do this operation much anymore because the trend has just been getting more and more to joint replacements. So let's talk about joint replacements for the hip and knee. The first successful total hip replacement wasn't that long ago, it was in 1962. It was done by Sir, Sir John Charnley, who was a, a, an Englishman, and he is sort of the father of total joint surgery. Um, I went to a conference many years ago where a couple of his junior attendings, guys that had worked with him for many years, presented cases, and it was like being in church. Um, I mean, I'm Catholic, and so, you know, when I go to Mass, at certain times, anything that said, you know, you bow your head or whatever, well, these guys were the same way. You know, you, you really expected somebody to come out throwing holy water, and, and because Sir John Charlie was pretty much a saint, according to these guys. And, and, of course, his development of hip replacements and ultimately knee replacements has been a godsend for people with arthritis who have a lot of pain. There's about 250,000 hip replacements and 500,000 knee replacements done annually in the United States. That's a lot of replacements. The nice thing about joint surgery, total joint surgery, is that it has at least a 90 to 95 percent success rate. Most of the time you see a marked improvement in the quality of life of that patient. And what I tell patients is, look, what's the, what number would you put on your pain? Zero is nothing, 10 is the worst. And most of the time, if somebody's thinking about joint replacement, they're thinking, oh, I'm kind of in the seven, eight, nine range. I'll tell them, look, I'm not going to get you down to zero, but I can probably get you down to 0.5 or one, which is a marked improvement over seven, eight, or nine. There are age considerations. We try not to do joint replacements in much younger patients because they're going to wear them out. There's really not a maximum age for joint replacement. Um, the oldest patient I did a total knee on was 94, and she came in and she was having terrible pain. We tried all of those other things, couldn't get her better. I said, ma'am, you need a joint replacement. She said, but I'm 94. I said, well, how long are you going to live? She said, well, of course I don't know. I said, look, the life insurance people will tell you you're going to live at least five more years. Do you want to have that pain? She said, no. I said, have your joint fixed. <clears throat> I saw her about a year after we did the joint replacement. She was 95. I said, ma'am, how are you? She said, oh, she said, my knee is great. The rest of me is falling apart. This is 95 years old. Some years later, I bumped into her daughter at a nursing home because I was going in to visit one of my relatives. And I said, she said, do you remember my mother? I said, yes, I do. I said, I'm sure by now she's passed on. The woman said, oh, no, mother's here at the home. Would you come in and say hello? I said, well, sure. So I went in to see her. I said, how are you? I'm Dr. Williams. I did your knee replacement. She's like, who are you? I said, well, never mind. Um, <laughs> I said, how's your knee? She said, my knee is doing great. I turned to the daughter. I said, ma'am, I said, how old is your mother? She said, mother is 103 years old. Mother lived to be 104. Not because of my knee replacement, but the moral of the story is, you know, age is just a number. And the knee lives on. Pardon? And the knee lives on. And the knee lives on, yes. The knee is somewhere. I don't even want to go there. <laughs> okay, let's talk about total hip replacement. In total hip, the hip is a ball in a socket, if you remember the x-rays I showed you before. And what we do is we replace both the ball and the socket. We usually do, we almost never do both hips at the same time. Once in a while at some of the university centers they'll do that, but up in the Lehigh Valley we usually just do one hip at a time. Um, the, this is a, a sort of what a total hip replacement looks like in the body. This is metal and plastic. This is metal. With a hip replacement, you're able to walk the next day. You're able to put weight on it the next day. Um, you, you start physical therapy the next day. My patients, usually they use a walker for two to four weeks and then a cane. What I tell them is when you come to see me two weeks after surgery, you'll be on a walker. When you come to see me six weeks after surgery, you'll either be using a cane or nothing. I usually let patients drive at about six to maybe eight weeks in, in terms of returning to work or sports, depends on what kind of job you do. Um, if it's a heavy lifting job, obviously that's going to be months and months. If it's a sedentary job, maybe six weeks, eight weeks. Uh, sports, 
Um, we usually recommend staying away from impact or twisting sports. Golf is okay. Doubles tennis is okay. Um, skiing, not so much unless you were a really, really, really good skier to start with. Um, singles tennis, not a good idea. Distance running, not a good idea. In total knee replacement, we replace three joint surfaces usually. The femur, that's the end of the thigh bone. The tibia, that's the shin bone. And the patella, or the kneecap. This is sort of what it looks like. This, is, this part would go with the tibia. This is the end of the thigh bone. And this thing here is the kneecap or patella. Um, both hip and knee replacement surgery can be done without bone cement or with bone cement. Um, in hip replacements, we almost never use bone cement. In knee replacements, some doctors do, some doctors don't. I happen to use bone cement because I think it gives a better fit, a better fix of the artificial joint to the body. Um, we can do both knees at the same time. I would say probably 10 to 20% of the patients I do knee replacement on, they get both knees done at the same time. Uh, the advantage is you're done. You don't have to come back for the other one. The disadvantage is the first two weeks you think you got hit by a truck, but it, most of the time it works out very nicely. Again, just like the hips, you're able to walk the next day. You get started in physical therapy the next day. Um, return to activities, kind of the same as for a hip replacement. Um, you know, walker for two to four weeks and then a cane and then nothing. In, in knee replacements, post-op physical therapy is very, 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 very important. Um, the few patients that I've had who refuse to go to therapy afterwards have not done well because you've got to move the knee and you have to get the leg strong. Now, there's been a big marketing, a big thing in, you know, marketing in the news and on the internet about what we call minimally invasive surgery. The incisions have gotten smaller as time has gone on. I mean, even my own incisions from 30 years ago are bigger than they are now. Unfortunately, the minimally invasive surgery has what we call a steep learning curve which means it takes a long time to learn how to do it properly. And um, you don't really want to be the first person that somebody's trying to do one of these minimally invasive surgeries on. The complication rate can be higher because, well, you're sort of the guinea pig, the student, while, while the doc is kind of learning how to do this new operation. Um, and my philosophy is, you know, you really need to be able to see what you're doing when you do a hip or a knee replacement. Also, computerized surgery, uh, some folks will advertise, well, I do, I do your hip or knee with computer assisted. Uh, that sounds really great, except it, it makes the surgery time longer, which means a little bit, theoretically, chance of infection. Um, and the studies in the orthopedic literature say it doesn't make a difference whether you use a computer or you, you have a good surgeon who knows what he's doing or she's doing. The ultimate goal is a properly implanted joint replacement. Smaller incision or faster surgery does not necessarily mean you're going to get a better result and sometimes can result in something like this. Um, let's talk about the possible complications of joint replacement. We've talked about the good things. Infection. The infection rate is a little bit less than 1%. We give antibiotics to try and prevent that. If you get an infection in a total joint, Sometimes it means you've got to start all over again, take that one out and put a new one in. And it's, it's really, it's not a good situation. Persistent pain. Prob you know, I said 90 to 95% of people are happy with their joint replacement. About 5% of people have substantial persistent pain. And even after we do all the studies and the x-rays and the CAT scans and the lab work, we still can't quite figure out why they still have pain. This thing called DVT or PE, this is blood clots in the leg, which can eventually travel to the lung. We give anti-clotting medicine to try and prevent that. Um, both of these are at least potentially dangerous. The, the PE, the pulmonary embolism, can be life-threatening. Um, medical issues, things like heart attack, stroke, um, pneumonia, we obviously try to keep an eye on these things and prevent them from happening. Um, but again, it's just like driving a car. Every once in a while, the hand of God reaches out and says, it's time. Um, loosening. The loosening rate on most total joints is about 1% per year. And what I tell patients is, look, 
If you're 60 years old and you have a joint replacement, by the time you reach 80, still 75% of those total joints should be working properly. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, so it's not like, oh, they only last 10 years or 15 years or there's an ad for one on TV that says it's tested for 30 years. Um, you know, they, they all tend to, uh, unless you have a bad prosthesis, and those are very few and far between, um, they tend to loosen at 1% per year. Um, recalls. What does loosening mean? Loosening means, okay, um, in, when you put the hip or knee in, you either use bone cement, which actually is more like a grout. In, think of a Thomas's English muffin. Most of my analogies involve food. Um, and it's got the nooks and crannies. That's what your bone is like. And so um, the bone cement gets into those nooks and crannies, and it also gets into the nooks and crannies of the prosthesis. And then when it hardens, it locks everything together. Well, just like anything mechanical, if you put it through enough cycles, you know, the bolts, the, the bolts on your car might loosen a little bit, or, or your cabinet door at home, you gotta, you know, retighten the, that's the same thing. And, and in the joints that, that you have not used bone cement, um, it's still, you've got the nooks and crannies of the prosthesis and the nooks and crannies of the bone and you sort of jam them together in surgery and they kind of lock in. But again, still with millions of cycles of walking or whatever, it can loosen a little bit. Can it be retidy? No. No, what you have to do is put a new one in. Yeah. But again, the loosening rate is about 1% per year. So most people, loosening is not an issue. Loosening is an issue in a younger patient. Um, or in a patient who's very, 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 very overweight. But, but in, you know, for, for those of us here in the room, except for the young folks in the back, um, you know, it's a prosthesis that's put in this year should last your lifetime. Um, recalls, of course, um, if you put on the news in the morning, there's always something about something being recalled and you know, you may have legal rights, please call. Um, most of the prostheses, prostheses that are in use now have never been recalled. Some of the metal-on-metal metal prostheses have been recalled, and some of the companies will have one or a particular one. Um, once we find out that they've been recalled, we obviously don't use that one anymore. And if you have one in that has been recalled, it's not like your car where you go in and, oh, we'll just change the parts out. If you're not having a problem with it, you leave it alone. Usually. The, the, the total hip or total knee prostheses that are recalled are recalled because after they've been be, being put in for a couple of years, we've, we've recognized that that particular design is inferior. Obviously, it's supposed to be tested. They are tested, but sometimes you've got to do a couple thousand of them before you say, oh, wait a minute, this one is not working as well as it should. And that's me. Um, we, we do these, we do these uh, wearing spacesuits uh, to keep things clean, keep the air in the room clean. We try to fight infection, um, and uh, that's why we do that. So anyway, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Yes? Okay, the quadriceps muscle is the one on the front of the leg. And the standard knee replacement, you, we cut part of the tendon to get into the knee. So that's a quadriceps splitting incision. And, you know, that's the, that's the standard one. It's the one that's been used for, I'm going to say, 40 years. It works pretty well in most patients. Um, it does take a lot of rehab to kind of get the quadriceps. You know, once you've insulted it, it doesn't want to work, and we've got to kind of coax it. There, there is an operation where you actually go in under the muscle instead of splitting the muscle. And in theory, that may be better, but it hasn't been tested enough to know is that, in fact, a better way to do it than the standard way. The, the hospital that is advertising that, I believe, is in South Jersey. It's called Virtua Hospital. And, and again, my question to those doctors would be, how many of these have you done? What are your results? What are your five-year, 10-year results? Are they any better than sort of doing it the standard way? Um, 
if you saw an ad for me that says Dr. John Williams is doing quadriceps sparing total knee surgery, my suggestion would be call somebody else. Because I, I don't do them and, and you don't, again, you don't want to be the first or 10th or 20th person. You want to be the 2,000th person that, that is having an operation. So I just caution you about things like the quadriceps sparing, the mini incision, the computerized. Um, it sounds great, but what are the, you know, let's prove it. You know, what, what is really the result? What's the long-term result? Example, um, a lot of, a lot of um, patients want something after knee surgery called a CPM machine. It's a machine that moves the knee for you. And that's the trend. Well, it really isn't because we've actually done studies that prove that it doesn't really help that much in the short term. And if you look at patients a year out, um, if you compare the patients that have had the CPM machine and the ones who didn't, there's no difference. And yet it, it costs a lot of money. So again, we have, to, we have to do the studies to prove that whatever that innovation is, is truly a good innovation. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we do what's called templating, and we can do that in the office on computer. Um, but when we do the hip and knee replacements, uh, assuming that we've properly evaluated the patient and, and know it's not some really weird kind that we need, we actually have a cart right outside the OR door that has, in the, in the instance of total knees, we have uh, C, D, E, F, G, H. We have six sizes of, of femur. We actually have women's and men's, and we have about six different sizes of tibia. And so we go in and we measure, we say, okay, this is a size D. I'm gonna want a right D, that's fine. And we measure the tibia right as after we've cut it, and we say, okay, this tibia looks like it's a size three, so I want a size three. And, and if we pick the wrong size and we go to put it on and say, oh, this is not gonna work, we need the next size up. It's just like being at, uh, in the Macy shoe department. Oh, go get me the size, whatever. Okay, so it's um, it's it's a it's an always an educated guess, more with the emphasis on educated than guess as to size. Is it the same for hips. Yes. Yeah. And do they have hips for females and males? No, the hips are the hips are the same. Uh, there's the smaller ones. Well, they have smaller ones. They do have smaller ones. Uh, uh, just like the knees, they actually go down to a size that we don't use in this country very much, but it's used in Asia because the, the, they're smaller bones. Um, but yeah, the hips, the hips is, is sort of unisex, whereas the knees, some companies, and I use, uh, I use a Zimmer product, and, and it's, it's, a woman, it's a woman's knee, and it's actually a little bit narrower, um, and there's some modification where the kneecap goes because women's kneecaps are a little different. But yeah, we have all the, uh, we have all the parts in stock, before we start. Yes, sir. Um, the benefits of a partial, first of all, we would do a partial knee replacement if only one side of the joint is worn out. Um, and, the, and the benefit of the partial is that it's, uh, usually you're only in the hospital one night instead of three, and the recovery is usually faster. The other advantage is if 10, 15 years down the road, you need, a, you need to have that part changed. It's not quite as much surgery as taking out a full total knee that was in and putting in a new total knee. That's called a revision. So, so there is a bit of an advantage. You don't want to do a partial or have a partial knee replacement if you have arthritis in, in more than one of the three areas of the knee. The knee has three different compartments. Um, <coughs> you can't do two thirds. It's either one third or the full, the full tilt. You can do without a patella. Um, I, in, in years past, I did, I would look at the knee as I was doing it and decide whether or not I wanted to replace the patella. It seems as I've gotten older, my patients have gotten older, and when I look at their knees, there's usually no question that the patella needs to be done. The problem is if you don't do the patella, and then later on they still have uh, front knee pain and you go back in to do the patella, the results are not quite as good. Um, when you do the patella, there is a little bit of an incidence of complications with doing the patella, like the patella can fracture or whatever, but 
again, most of my patients anymore, they get, they get the, the patella replaced as well as the rest of the knee. But remember, that list of all those treatment options, surgery was at the bottom. Doesn't mean it doesn't work, but it means we try a lot of other things first to, to see if we can help patients without surgery. Yes. I took prednisone for arthritis in my knee mm -hmm. for about a week, and then he said if I wasn't better to give me a shot after that. Is it okay to take that call of prednisone? Yes. If, if you came into my office and said, Dr. Williams, um, I was on a Medrol dose pack for a week, it didn't help, can I have a cortisone shot? I'd say not a problem. Now, you wouldn't want to do that, come in then the following week and say, could I have another cortisone shot and the follow, you know, but, but, um, to, to have followed the oral prednisone with the injection, not usually a problem. So then how, how soon could I have another shot? Everybody's different. I don't want to box your doctor into, into a corner. What I tell my patients is, <clears throat> depends on their age. In, in, in somebody most of our age, I would probably say, look, absolutely no more often than three months. I'd really rather it be closer to six months. Um, <clears throat> And the only time I make an exception for that, if somebody comes in, they got a cortisone shot, and they come in six weeks or two months later, and they say, listen, the shot worked great, but I'm going on vacation tomorrow, and my knee is hurting again. Can I have another cortisone shot at least to get me through vacation? I'll say, fine, but when you come back from vacation, you've got to come in and talk to me because we're going to have to do some other different things. So, so flexibility, I think, is the word. Any other questions? Uh, yes. So I was wondering what the I was just diagnosed, I guess, with mm -hmm. a hip. I thought I pulled a muscle only to find out that it's, I guess, a degeneration of the hip. And, uh, but I opted to start to have some physical therapy, which today was the first one that I got. <laughs> it's killed me to die. The first thing with the stretching years. Right. I did, yeah. But is this a smart thing to do before, if you had to have surgery, to have PE before, physical therapy before you have the surgery? PT is almost never a bad idea. <clears throat> so, so, yeah, I, you know, to have the PT, to start to get the muscles stronger, I, I think that's a good idea. In fact, Medicare is coming out with new rules that is going to, that is going to mandate three months of therapy before a joint replacement. Oh, really? Now, I think that's silly, but obviously I'm not a government official, but yeah. They're also cutting back on how much therapy you can have. Well, yeah, it's sort of, it's sort of unfair, because on the one hand, Medicare is saying, okay, you have to have three months of therapy before you can have a joint replacement, and then on the other hand, they're saying, well, no, we, you know, we're cutting back on therapy. Well, well, which is it? Do you want them to have therapy, or do you not want them to have therapy? But you do think it's... I think it's very reasonable, yes. Yes. But, you know, that doesn't take away a lot of the pain. You know, like at night, I mean, can I take, like, some, I'm, I'm an aspirin person. I mm -hmm. always take an aspirin for Although it hasn't helped with this situation. But, uh, I mean, is there, could I try it again? Like tonight, I mean, this, with this. Are you pain, taking, you're taking the Mobic. Yes, you, once a day. Yeah, don't take aspirin when you're taking Mobic because the combination is really not good for your stomach. Yeah. I mean, you could do Tylenol. You could do extra strength Tylenol because they're, they're different drugs. Yeah. But yeah, you don't want to mix Mobic with Advil, Aleve, Aspirin. Yeah. yeah no, as I said, it did nothing for me to start with them and it always helped everything. But you're saying something like extra strength Tylenol? Yeah. If you're going to take the Mobic, and I personally think the Mobic is a good drug. If you're going to take the Mobic, then, then you've got to stay away from the other ones except for the extra strength Tylenol. Not, not really, um, but just because the x-rays look worse doesn't always mean that the symptoms are worse. Um, again, the glucosamine will sometimes help calm things down and, um, you know, the repeated, the visco supplementation shots, but if, if they're not working, then your you have two choices, you know, grin and bear it, do the best you can, or, you know, it's, it's time, to, time to fix it.
And, and I tell patients, you know, you'll know when it's time. When you look in the mirror at the, in the morning and you say, you know what, I'm getting really tired of this, then it's time. If you're looking in the mirror saying, eh, you know, it's not so bad, I can, I can deal with this, then it, you're not ready yet. But when you look in the mirror and say, you know what, I don't want to. I I don't want to live like this. It's too much. It's just too much. It's time. We live in a fast-paced, on-demand world where everything is available at a moment's notice. Now your health care can be on-demand as well. Coordinated Health, the name you trust for superior care, now offers care on-demand, where you can walk in, no appointment necessary, and receive immediate care for all non-life-threatening emergencies. With specialists in primary care, orthopedics, cardiology, and women's health, and locations throughout the Lehigh Valley and Poconos, quality care is never out of reach. Coordinated Health, your prescription for better health.